Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, Perspectives on Energy here in ThinkTech Hawaii. I'm your host, Guillermo Sabatier, uh, Director of International Services for HSI. And today we have uh, joining us as our guest is Rocky Cease, VP of, Inter of uh, Industrial Skills at HSI and also founder of SOS International. And we'll be talking about how we train the new energy industry professionals. Rocky, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here, Gamma. All right. So uh, very excited to have you here. And one thing, uh, one disclaimer, Rocky also happens to be a good friend of mine. So so definitely uh, really exciting to have him as my guest. And this would be a nice flowing conversation. Um, Rocky has been in the same industry uh, that that I've been. And in fact, that I've worked for the same company. Rocky hired me over to SOS and then later was acquired by HSI. So, um, what, we're, so Rocky, t tell us more about uh, how you started SOS and what, what need you, you know, that you met for the industry, that idea. Well, I, I, st I started in the industry as a junior engineer at a company called South Carolina Electric and Gas way back in 1981. So been at this a little over 40 years. Um, in um, 1998, uh, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation it, uh, started its first system operator certification program. And in the original program, the only way to maintain the certification was to retake the exam every five years. So in 2002 and 2003, uh, we got the idea that if we could build a training program to help operators recertify, in other words, retake the exam after five years, and to help new operators uh, that were entering the industry to take the exam for the first time, and if we could do a, put together a product that would provide assistance in passing that exam, that might be a good place to start a business. So that is, in a nutshell, is how we got started. Right. And, and uh, definitely there, there's a huge uh, regulatory component, right, that came, came along after that, right, where, where there were a few changes. There, there was a couple of incidents known as a, the Northeast blackout in 2003, mm -hmm. and that, that completely, completely pulls a whole new set of responsibilities. So tell, tell us more about that and how, how, how you met that, that, uh, that challenge. Well, well, since we had just started the company not too long before the blackout in 2003, uh, a lot of our friends called and asked if we were the reason for the blackout, which uh, I'm glad to say we were not. Um, but um, but uh, because of the blackout in 2003, uh, a lot of things happened after that. The, the United States Congress decided to get involved in uh, the performance of system operators, among other things, but we're talking about system operators. So Congress got involved. They passed the Energy Policy Act of 2005. Mm -hmm. um, and it included many things. Uh, uh, a lot of them were, frank, very frankly, good for our business. They changed from a certification uh, every five years to a one-time certification with continuing education hours. And depending on your classification, you may have to have up to uh, 200 hours in a 36-month period in order to renew your certification. Uh, they also began tightening up the exam. Uh, the exams got more difficult to pass, and they also implemented a simulation requirement, uh, which was a, a, a big impact on our business as well. So those are some of the things that took place because of the blackout in 2003. Okay, all right. It's really interesting. And 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 uh, speaking of simulation, so tell us how that has, has shaped the way we, we train our operators now. I mean, well, how it was back then, because the nature of, of, of how we train, the nature of who we're training now, has completely changed over the last five, 10, even 15 years. Um, would you tell us more about that? Because I know you've been the cutting edge of that. Yeah, sure. Sim simulation is a game changer. Um, but until the late uh, 2010, 2012, not very many people had access to a simulation. Um, simulations were at that time were built. They were replicas of the system that you operated, and they could be a million dollars. And um, of course, if we look at the utilities in our country in North America, let's include Canada in that, uh, many of the utilities are small. So a million dollars for simulation is a big number for that. So one of the game changers for our industry and for our business at that time, SOS, was we developed a, uh, a generic simulation that we could make available uh, at a much less cost than that to teach the principles of system operation. So in much the same way that a pilot can get into a mm -hmm. flight simulator and practice flying a plane in various scenarios, 
we were now able to take simulation to virtually 100% of the operators, the 10,000 system operators in North America, and make that easily available to them so that they could practice operating the grid mm -hmm. in a variety of scenarios and practice their response to those scenarios. That's really interesting. And, and, and I've seen a, and, and I've used your particular sim simulator as well, and, and uh, definitely really, really helpful. And uh, now we're also, it's not just the system operators, but we're also now simulating distribution dispatch controllers. So that's another, tell us more about that. Oh, yeah, well, absolutely. Uh, because of the, the amount of renewables that are being installed at private residences and private businesses, in the past, our generation, if you, for 100 years, our generation facilities were connected to the transmission grid, and we had huge power plants, whether, whether they were coal-fired, hydro, nuclear, or whatever, they were hundreds of megawatts. Well, now we've been able to get renewable energy, such as solar and wind, down to a much smaller scale, um, and some applications are in the homes. Well, you have the transmission operators that operate the high voltage lines right. and you have distribution operators that they operate the lines in your neighborhood. And so because of those changes, now we're beginning to have generation sources at the distribution level. And so now those operators need to understand uh, as much about how the grid works as the transmission operators need to know. So it's, it's an expansion of what we have done for the last 20 years at the, at the transmission operations level. Now we're taking that to the distribution operators. Okay. Yeah. Now, now one thing that, that I'm noticing is it's, it's going to be really, really uh, vital, right, to train this, this upcoming workforce is uh, there's been a lot of data on, on the, the type of operator, the type of candidates is being, is being hired now. It's, it's not quite what it used to be in the past. Um, it's, it's, they're coming from different backgrounds, but not quite traditionally the utilities. You want to, could you tell us more about that? Yeah, when I was a young man in the district, in the trend, in the, I should say the electric industry, when I was a young man in the electric industry, most of our operators came from power plants or field positions, maybe they were substation techs, but they came into the control room understanding pretty thoroughly the principles of electricity and how it worked. Plus they had been in the field or they had been in a plant and they understood how their facilities were operated and that was useful in the control room. What happened over time is the demographics began to change and we were less able to hire people from other parts of the utility business and we were forced to hire individuals either straight out of college or straight out of high school or off the street so to speak and bring them into the control room so that that resulted in a whole different chain, training challenge than we had ever had before. In the past, we had to take someone that was maybe not an expert in operations, but had some experience in their particular field that they worked in. Now we were bringing people into the control room that had no experience in any aspect of operations. And so we had to take a true novice and work with them to turn them into a professional expert system operator. Well, and that, that, that definitely puts a lot of uh, emphasis and pressure on the initial training aspect of their, of their, of their career. Well, this new career, really, because uh, I've also seen a lot of them coming in from different industries, like right. altogether different industries. And then go, they go from the oil and gas into the electric, which, which in, a, in a lot of utilities, you know, they're, they're, they're sometimes, yeah, they, they do handle both, but it's really interesting to see that transition. What has been your experience with that? I'll, I'll tell you a story about that. Um, I won't name the utility at this point, but but we had a a, a class, a, an instructor-led class. We do a lot of things online as well, but we had an instructor-led class. And one of the individuals in the class was a candy maker on Friday. On Monday, they were in a NERC certification class, so they came in really knowing nothing and uh, and having having to get up to speed. So it's just a matter of repositioning the training uh, and developing a lot of new training because in the past, we were able to assume that the individual's knew something about electricity mm -hmm. and literally over a period of a couple of years, we were now training individuals that knew nothing about it, about electricity. Right. And that is, that is a, an interesting challenge right now because I'm, we're seeing that uh, occurring more and more, with more and more frequency when it comes to uh, uh, either the workforce or there's lack of availability. And I know that COVID has had an impact, but what has been your experience with, with, with that particular side of the, or how that impacted our business? Well, you know, COVID, mostly what the utilities tried to do was protect their system operators. If you think about a control room, a control room is a 
24 by 7 by 365 operation. And so they operate all the time and they have rotating shifts. Um, and so their concern was that the COVID virus might infiltrate their operating staff and just wipe out the entire staff. Um, you know, the most extreme case would be to lose someone uh, due to the death of COVID right. to COVID and then others just being too sick to work. And of course, there was the issue of, of infecting anyone who hadn't already been exposed to the virus. So mostly the utilities sequestered their operating staff, right. many of them for months at a time. And they, they set up uh, uh, camping locations and cots yeah. and warehouses and uh, of course, then all even. Uh, yeah, and all the logistics that went with that. And um, so that was a challenge. Uh, oddly enough, most of the utilities were able to deal with that pretty well. Um, that we shut down face to face meetings and our business, uh, we traveled a lot. You know that we both traveled a lot. Mm -hmm. And the travel for two years, there was no travel. And so now we are just now beginning to travel again as we've got the vaccines and the treatments and we understand the virus a little bit better. Um, so, yeah, it, it definitely had an impact on the operations, had an impact on the way we interact with the operators. Right. And, um, we continue to see some of that. There are still places, utilities, where they won't allow outsiders to come in because of concerns about the virus. Well, well as far as helping deliver some, so some of the training recently, now, now at HSI, uh, I have noticed that there, there, there has been quite a, a lot of activity when it comes to in, live instructor-led uh, online training. And I, I taught quite a few of those courses recently, and and it's um, it has its challenges, right? But so, what has been your impression with that? Your well, you know, it, it it was a viable alternative because the advances in the internet had come so far, right. technology like Zoom and and other platforms where you could do that, and um, so we were able to put a live instructor in front of people who were somewhere else in real time, so that you could have that interaction. I don't think you know. I'm, 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 I've been doing this for a long time, you know, with the company over 22 years. Um, I don't think anything takes the place of being face to face right. in person in the same room with the instructor and the trainee. Um, however, virtual, you know, across the internet training is as close as we could get. It's, it's certainly more personable than right. online training with no instructor, just, you know, right. uh, just, just the materials in front of you. And a lot of a lot of um, material can be shared in that manner and be done what and that sharing be done well, uh, but some material, particularly tech, technical material, mm -hmm. is really nice to be able to see the and interact with the instructor live, even if it is across the internet. It's better to be in person, right. but across the internet. Is, and you and like you said, you did it yourself. By right. the way, you have a great reputation. You must do a really good job at it. <laughs> and um, so, uh, so uh, yeah, so it works. It works, and and, and I, I I've seen what I've seen is, is is there's a there's a generational difference, right? Where uh, uh, there there's a there's some of the operators for them it's just like a fluid transition into this whole online live instruction, and then there's others who really don't like it, and, and there there's some in between, right? And it's from my experience, it's been. Um, it has not been too difficult to deliver a live online training. Uh, usually a challenge mostly is engagement, right? To, to get them engaged. Right. But, but, but I've noticed that it's, if it's a smaller group, it's a lot easier. Usually, and usually in groups of no more than 10, it seems to be really, really effective. Um, speaking of simulation, especially when, when I guess about that, that really, really gets, uh, gets everybody engaged. Right? And especially when you're simulating a, a, a book electric system with a grid. What is your what is your prediction of where we might be headed, right? Regarding how uh, this tool and how it'll enhance reliability and uh, human performance and error reduction. Well, anytime you can practice scenarios, I mean, I, I think it would be impossible to imagine every scenario that an operator might face. So, so the first thing you have to do is help the operator understand the principles of electricity and the principles of operating the grid. And then you start putting them through scenarios. And one way to do scenarios is uh, modeled on past events. Right. Uh, and, then, and then maybe perhaps modeled on events that could happen, but maybe they've never happened, but they could happen. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it's a matter of repetition. Um, and if you go through and you repeat doing something often enough, 
then it becomes second nature. It's, it's, it becomes subconscious. Right. And um, so we, we try to walk the operators through what we call uh, unconscious incompetence to, a, to an unconscious competence, where uh, on the one end, the new operators, they think, they think about everything they do before they do it. On the other end, you have someone that is unconsciously competent, and they, everything, so many things are second nature to them. And, and I think one of the things that, that we forget sometimes in system operations is system operations, the work itself is about 95% routine, right. uh, maybe yeah. even boring, and 5% chaos. And you never know when the chaos is coming. It just one minute, everything's fine. And the next minute, everything is just, uh, you know, just falling apart around you. And yeah. so not everybody can handle that. So one of the things we try to do in simulation is to, is to simulate that experience in scenarios right. where everything looks fine and then things start happening um, so that you learn to, to, to you know, decisive, decisiveness, uh, decision-making is a skill that can be learned. You can improve that skill right. by going through scenarios in much the way you can do training to fly or you can do training right. to drive. The more you drive, the, the more skilled yeah. you are at responding to things. Same thing with system operators. So, so you can't, do those scenarios in real life it, with enough frequency for the operator to to call that training but right. you can put them on a simulator and do it over and over and over until they almost it's almost second nature to respond to some of those events well w one of the really important skills i see in the simulation especially when managing emergencies has been uh acquiring the skill where they're able to prioritize the urgency of those emergencies and what to handle first and 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 uh, you and I both know the contingency analysis, right? Where where yes. this 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 program does a lot of what if scenarios for you, and it tells you the worst thing shows up first, and you handle that first, right? And 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 usually usually that that's something that takes a while for some operators to actually get a handle on. But a simulation usually that helps them when it comes to reducing errors, right? Because usually knowing what priority to 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 put together is is really important. Oh. And, and we've gotten a lot better at giving the operators tools to help determine those priorities. Um, uh, you were you were in a control room just like I was, you know, in you know, 10, 15 years ago, mm -hmm. when something happened, a lot of alarms start going off in the control right. room. I mean, you know, voltage, frequency, relays, opening, breakers, close, opening, closing, a lot of things happen. And every one of those events generates an alarm. And the alarms would just come up on a screen and be line after line after line after line of alarms. Now we've gotten a lot better at, at using algorithms and other tools to prioritize those alarms. So the more significant alarms show up at the top of the list or, and some of the least significant you know, aren't, I mean, they're way down on the list. The operator may never see them at all. Um, mm -hmm. But, but it still takes judgment on the operator's part. They should never um, trust those algorithms a hundred percent. You really right. need to pay attention. You need the skill. Um, you need for the you need the training. You need to become very capable of doing making those decisions. Well, th this is going to lead me to my next question, right? And, and, and it's interesting that there there is a lot of conversation now, where where they want to turn over as much control as possible to the machine. And as right. as, as we all know, you know, uh, machine learning AI, AI is developing and, and becoming well, way more way more uh, resilient and, and re reliable. Um, I myself have a little apprehension in, in getting my head around how, how can a machine handle everything, you know, when it comes time to doing this. So, so I am still wondering uh, what what your opinion is on that as far as where we're headed and what you think is 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 being worked on right now regarding that. Um, we've cooperated with some studies done by um, University of North Carolina in Charlotte, mm -hmm. Clemson University, NC State, and some others. Uh, and that's one of the things that we've taken a look at is how artificial intelligence is going to affect the job of being a system operator. I, th right. I think artificial intelligence will be a tool for the operator. I think that we can get better at uh, and provide better tools for the operator to make the decisions they have to make. Um, at this moment, I'm kind of like you. I, I, I don't know that artificial intelligence will take over that job completely. Um, I think there will always be circumstance. Like I said, you can't forecast everything. Right. I think there will always, there's always the potential for cir circumstances that are outside of the parameters of the scenarios that you put together for the operators. Right. right. Um, you can't write a procedure for everything. You know, that's, that's another area that we mm -hmm. talk about, you know, what, what are guidelines because you can't forecast everything versus what are procedures. 
where you go through the same steps and get the same outcome every time. You can't write a procedure for everything. You can't imagine a scenario for everything. So um, now artificial intelligence is, is supposed to learn. Uh, right. you know, how, many, how many events would the AI have to go through to learn it in order to be smart enough to keep it from happening, but you know, again, down the road. So I don't know. I, I'm in a little bit of a wait and see. I, I, I'm a supporter of AI. I think it's uh, will definitely be a useful tool. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it will take the place of a live system operator, I'm not so convinced of that right now. Well, I think it'll it'll become more of a partnership, and it'll become a, a whole suite of enhanced tools. The operator will still be managing managing the the, the the shift, the operation of the actual grid at that point. But a, a lot of things may be automated. But the, I think it, initially it'll help relieve a lot of the clutter of information, right? That that uh, and I think of course it'll enhance human performance because there there are some human performance errors that come with this overload of information. And 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 uh, right now it's it's a uh, here with, you know, at, at HSI we, we we have a whole set of courses on human performance. Uh, human performance training, human performance, and how to error reduction. So, so that's another important aspect that that we, we work on. So, I think yeah, there's, there's, yeah, there's several aspects of human performance. There's not only uh, how do you use your training techniques, how do your trainers, how mm -hmm. does your training material impact human performance, but also how well the individual understands their own strengths and weaknesses affect right. their human performance as well. Um, so, there are things that we need to do as individuals to prefer, to um, improve our human performance. Uh, but there are also things that we need, to, the tools that we offer, the environment that we offer, uh, the, the, the way that we uh, apply the work and schedule the work right. also right. makes human performance. It, human performance is a, is a big hairy thing in and of itself. Well, it's interesting because on my next segment, I, I'm going to have a, a a doctor that does functional medicine, and he'll talk about how, how optimizing health and hormonal balance impacts human performance and, and uh, uh, some studies on, on how that le hormonal imbalance led to some errors that had accidents. So, so uh, that'll be a good uh, follow-up to this show when we're talking about human performance. So it should be interesting. But, but uh, yeah. So, so uh, what what is it that we're looking at now for, for candidates, right? How the how are companies attracting new candidates, uh, whether it's internal or from other industries, even? Well, that that's a bit of a challenge in our industry. The the electric utility industry is what 150 years old now, mm -hmm. and uh, most young people think of as an old established industry, maybe maybe even boring. So mm -hmm. one thing that we've got to do when we're recruiting is to help them to understand that that our industry is exciting, that there are a lot of things going on here, that it can be, electric utility can be a great place to work. Um, they're, they're, they seem to be more receptive of the renewable utilities, the, the companies that are working, they, they consider the renewable space to be new and exciting. Um, but a lot of those same things are going on at our legacy utilities like Duke and Pacific Gas and Electric that have been been around for a long time. And, um, and so helping them to understand that those are exciting businesses to work in. Also changing our recruitment techniques, changing the job, uh, changing the way that we train so that uh, one of the things that we have to deal with some of the younger folks now is their attention span, um, not universally, not everybody, but in general, their attention span is pretty short because of uh, TV and commercials and social media. media yeah, and all the things that they're used to. So yes. you'll find we're, we're now offering training in 10 minute snippets, uh, maybe even you know 30 second snippets, depending on the topic and whatnot, so that uh, they don't have to be engaged for so long, but they can still pick up information that they need for their jobs. Okay, that's really interesting. And, 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 um, and you know, the, 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 the industry is evolving, the training needs are evolving, and then us as a training provider, we're also evolving. So. So we're, we're, we're striving to be on the cutting edge of that. And, and there's some exciting new technology coming up that we're also looking at. So it should be very exciting. Uh, any last final thoughts? We got a few minutes left on the show, like two. But any final thoughts on things that we're looking at developing as far as training or training delivery? Sure. The, the, you know, when I founded the company 20 years, well, back in 2002, uh, the niche we were working in was pretty small. I mean, we mentioned earlier the... Uh, there's basically, there's actually a little less, but there's roughly 10,000 men and women that operate the grid in North America. 
And those are the men and women that had to be certified. So that was our core business was working with those individuals. And so essentially we had a small company, but we were very fortunate to have our company and, and enjoyed it very much, but we were really a small company. So now with what's happening um, and joining forces with HS, HSI, we're part of a much larger organization with, with many more resources, uh, many more opportunities to have an influence, a positive influence on the business and where it's going. So, so now we offer not only training for transmission operators, but we're, as you mentioned earlier, we're building training for distribution operators. We have uh, also built training for power plant operators. Now we're looking at substation engineers. And, oh, and I don't know that at SOS, I, I, we probably would have gotten around to it, but it might have taken a few more years. And, and our partnership, our, our acquisition by HSI will, will allow that to happen a lot faster. And, and um, it'll, be, it'll be a lot of fun for young guys like you, old guys like me, I don't know, but young guys like <laughs> Not you. Not that young anymore, but. <laughs> it, 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 it'll, it'll be exciting. All right. Okay. Uh, we are now at a point where we're about to close. We're a minute away, but uh, again, it's, it's amazing how quickly 30 minutes go, go by, right? When you're having a good conversation about stuff you like mm -hmm. so, with, with people, with people you enjoy talking to. So Rocky, once again, thank you so much for coming on the show as a guest. Uh, um, uh, we're uh, here at Think Tech Hawaii and, and on this show in particular, our aim is to educate and, and, and spread the word about what we're doing and, and, uh, I think we, you know, we strive to do that every every two weeks. So um, hopefully you'll be a guest with us again soon. <laughs> I hope so. I'm very impressed with what Think Tech is doing and uh, and whatnot. So real happy to be part of the show. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody.